Welcome to the podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame, created and produced by educator and author Mark Hoberman, owner and director of Grade Success Tutoring. The purpose of this program is to offer our listeners a variety of stories dealing with many interesting topics surrounding education. It is our hope that students and parents alike will benefit from the wide range of topics, including study skills, test prep, anti-bullying, sports, music, and more. A special aspect of our podcast is that the shows will also feature a teen guest host. We hope you enjoy our show, Lighting the Educational Flame. Hello and welcome to the podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame. Our show is conceived and produced by Mark Hoberman, owner and director of Grade Sess Education. A unique feature of this podcast is not only featuring stories that touch upon all aspects of education, but also the shows are guest hosted by various high school and college students. This is Sammy Sandler, and I am proud to be today's guest host on the podcast, and I am thrilled to be speaking with Deirdre Regal. Deirdre is an author, singer, conductor, and dancer. So, Deirdre, as I mentioned, you're an author. Uh, what is the title of your book, and what inspired you to write it? Well, Sammy, first of all, thank you for your time. It's delightful to be on your show, and I, I'm so thrilled to be part of the program because I'm such a believer in educating our people, all of our people of all ages, to produce the great future that I know is in store for our planet. So thank you so much for your efforts and your being part of that, and thank you for having me on your show. The name thank of you. My book, thank you very well. well. The name of my book is called My Letter to My Father. And it is about healing my relationship with my father, uh, which a process that began in, it was a process that began in 2009, and the book has just been released in 2017. Um, so quite the story with the book, and I'm very glad that it's on the market and uh, able to be sold to people who wish to purchase it. And if you wish to purchase it, where can people purchase it? They can go to balboapress.com. That's B-A-L-B-O-A press.com. And again, the name of the book is My Letter to My Father. So I'd, I'd love to talk a bit of, um, more about that, Sandy, if that would be okay with you. Oh, yes. Um so what obstacles did you have to overcome to become a published author? Oh, my, what a great question. This was my first book, and uh, it's always a learning curve anytime we do something for the first time, as we all know. Um, just I think just the fear of the unknown is the first thing. Um, and I, 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 the, the other thing was, as you hear me stutter say this, normally I'm so articulate, to really convey what happened internally on the emotional and psychological level with my father on a piece of paper in a way that other people could understand and, and receive it was a great challenge. So uh, the, and the, I, should, I should frame this with the book is actually a, a compilation of 27 letters from myself, one, actually two of them rather being from myself and my father, and the rest are from other people. And we have people uh, contributing letters from literally all over the world. This became quite a project that, that grew and grew. And uh, the other challenge was to invite people to be a part of this and present that invitation to them in such a way that they felt comfortable with it. And that was one of the big obstacles is, for all of us is, is accessing these deep emotions that uh, can even sit in our subconscious, driving us without our awareness and especially with our, parent, uh, our parental relationships, which, of course, is where everything begins for us, to really get into those deep emotions and unearth those things that were either pleasant or unpleasant, in my case, unpleasant. Uh, that's a very, very, very big obstacle to overcome. Uh, however, once we overcome it, I think it's like the, the runner who's, you know, knowing he's winning the race. Um, you're off and running, and, and you, you, can, you can get to it. The other obstacle simply was dealing with a publisher and knowing which, which business choices were the best to make. And there was a big, big learning curve there. Uh, I think the other obstacle, Sammy, was the fear of failure, fear, the actual fear of failing myself. Uh, there was nobody involved with the book uh, in the beginning except myself. And so was I being true to myself and was I really honoring myself and was I going to do a good job with this? And uh, then ultimately would I represent my father well uh, in that process also. So there were there are many obstacles to writing a book. And you get all done the book and you're so proud of it and, and you you tend to forget all the, the pain that you went through with it and all the glories and all the joys and all the highs and lows, all the emotional roller coaster. And um, then you, the book is done, and, and you go, gee, I'd like to do another one. <laughs> so, there were quite a few obstacles, yes. Now, um, especially considering all you went through 
to make the book and you talked about that fear of failure and it just seems to be such a such a popular topic, especially at college commencement speeches and graduation speeches. Now, especially because there are so many students that we get as uh, listeners, um, what can you say about, you know, really going after your passion and, and dealing with that fear of failure? And obviously you've been able to overcome it considering all the success you've had in, with the book and, and your music. Well, thank you. What would I say? I, I would share what I say to myself every day. Courage. Have courage. Step forward and do it. And the irony of that is that that first step is the hardest. When we get to the finish line, we look back and say that first step was probably the easiest. That doesn't mean that things get harder along the way, but we look back and we say, wow, that first step was the perfect thing for me to do. And and I think when we finish something, we can look back with a sense of ease and grace and a sense of accomplishment, uh, uh, gratitude for who we are, uh, and quite frankly, praise for ourselves that we had the courage to take that very first step into the unknown. Sometimes, and this will be appropriate for your generation, Tammy, with only a dream to guide us, only a dream, and maybe not even feeling that we're standing on solid ground or that we're, we have all the support we need, but only that dream to guide us. And I'm here to tell you that when we do have that dream squarely in front of us, squarely in front of us, The first step is scary, yes. But once we've made it, it actually gets easier from there. The second step is easier because we know the path. We're starting to define our path, and we can feel that path beneath our feet. And I think often all of us, all of us, no matter what age we are, wait for the path to appear when the the real gift and the real power that lies within us is for us to create the path rather than wait for it to appear. That way we are powerful creators of the first step, the next step, the next step, the next step. And in creating our pathway, we can invite the other powerful energies of goodness that come into our life that we can mesh with and we can create a picture that is good for us as individuals and can provide goodness and foundation for many others. And that's where the magic happens and that's where each step gets easier and easier and easier. The trick is knowing the timing and being able to trust ourselves no matter what. Even if we feel like we've made a misstep, for me, the, 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 the bottom line is nothing happens by accident. Nothing happens for nothing. And there really are no mistakes. It's just a matter of learning. Oh, gee, I don't, I didn't, oh, I shouldn't do it that way. Oh, shouldn't do it that way. But I will do it this way instead. And again, I say it's creating our own path rather than waiting for it to appear. And, and I think that's such beautiful advice, especially considering, at least from what I've gathered from my generation, that's so filled with anxiety and fear of failure. I think that's just such wonderful advice. And you know, when you were younger, you know, what, what age did you really discover music was your passion and who helped you along the way to pursue a career in music? Uh, when I was eight years old, my mother saw to it that I received piano lessons. And then uh, when I was 12, my parents agreed that I needed voice lessons because I remember my mother saying one day to one of our neighbors, Deidre loves to sing. She goes around the house singing all the time, and I was not aware of this, but my mother, in spite of her difficult, difficult struggle with alcoholism, was aware enough to know that I had this talent in me, and um, it was my father, actually, who would drive me on a Saturday morning to, uh, to my piano lessons after a long week of being on the road and away from home for five days at a time. And I mentioned this in my book, and I thank him for what a big sacrifice it was for him to drive me on a Saturday morning to my piano and then ultimately my piano and voice lessons. So my parents were very good to me in that regard. Uh, They were sorely lacking in many other areas, but looking back, they gave me exactly what I needed to be where I am today, and I thank them enormously as I've healed those relationships. So my parents saw that, and... And uh, at, at eight years old, I began. At twelve years old, I began uh, uh, the. Uh, at eight years old, I began the piano. At twelve years old, I began the voice. And from there, I just took off. Music, music was all of a sudden my very best friend, and it saw me through very difficult and challenging times to challenges to be overcome. Uh, in my childhood, music became my best friend, and it still is. And it's a way for me to express those deep. Uh, those deep emotions uh, that connect uh, me with being human and, and, you know, what's more passionate uh, to 
what's, what, what can we be more passionate about than being human would be my, would be my question. Um, I, I can't think of anything, honestly. I right? <laughs> can maybe be more human. But, yeah. um, you know, we, uh, you've also conducted before, and as we're talking about breaking barriers, are there any barriers you've broken uh, while becoming a conductor? Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I began conducting professionally in the late 80s, and uh, the quick story here is I was doing a lot of singing as a mezzo-soprano with an opera company, and in the opera world, mezzos get to play men, maids, and usually the town prostitute, and I was very worn out with that. We think opera is so pristine, but it's really about real life, and uh, I was just really worn out with the singing opera, and at the time I was producing my own big Broadway Vegas review and doing a lot of other things, and I was just really at the point where where I needed to take a little break from singing, and uh, I was in a production, I was in rehearsal, actually, excuse me, I was in rehearsal for a production of Traviata, La Traviata, and uh, the chorus master slash assistant conductor suddenly died three weeks before we went to production. And uh, I heard myself say to the uh, the artistic management of the company, you know, I'd be happy to fill in until you can hire somebody else. And I looked around the room and, and asked, did I just say that? Who, who said that? Did I really offer that? And it had indeed been myself. And again, the passion. I'd always, I'd always enjoyed conducting, but I didn't realize how much I enjoyed it. And that led to the start of very serious conducting uh, in the opera pit. I'd always cut my eye teeth in the opera pit as a conductor because I knew the form. Uh, of art, and uh, then I went on to form my own opera orchestra, a 32-piece orchestra with six singers and a board and a 20-member chorus, and that went on for six years, and I did a lot of regional conducting, and uh, I did this at a time when women were expected to be comfortable only being players in an orchestra, and it was very unusual for a woman to be in a command or authority position on the podium. And uh, for me, this was very natural because my, my sense of leadership is very strong, and I really love to nurture large, large groups of people and bring forth a wonderful energy and bring forth a power of creativity and love those people while I do that. But what I ran into was a, a lot of attitude about it, a lot of resistance, and strangely, some of it came from women uh, looking at me like, wow, wow, are you sure you really are comfortable wanting to be up there. And I think some of it was protectiveness. Uh, but I ran into a lot of attitude. You know, what are you a woman doing up there? Shouldn't you be home washing the dishes? Or shouldn't you be sitting, you know, in, in that chair that we know you as is sitting in the in the flute chair playing flute? Um, and uh, it, it was quite the challenge. And I, I experienced what I think some of us will, will relate to, man or woman, working twice as hard for half the respect. Um, and I was, uh, when I began conducting, it was a time when there were about only 80-some women conductors in positions uh, in this country. And uh, little by little, that began to shift. And uh, as we have more women doctors today than we've ever had, we, you know, we have female air, airline pilots. You know, we women have had to really, really, really buckle down and say, listen, we are human beings and we are enormously skilled and we want to contribute to our world uh, in larger ways than we've been in the past. And so I just had to buckle down and take the hits and and remain non-retaliatory uh, and remain calm and focused and loving and, again, keeping my eyes on the goal. And, yes, fear was driving me because what if I did make a mistake? What if I did something wrong or said something wrong or, or didn't appear to be as educated as a man would be? What would, what would be the result? Would I lose respect? And I had to navigate that very carefully. Uh, and, and it was like getting on a horse for the first time. The horse is going to challenge you and see if you really know how to ride the horse. And I've had that experience as well. So it was it was a matter of maintaining a steady grip on my sense of reality and remaining loving. And little by little, the scene began to shift. Uh, later on, uh, as I... As I pursued uh, more conducting, I found myself in 2003 uh, in Eastern Europe uh, conducting a 30-minute symphony, uh, standing in front of the Bulgarian National uh, Orchestra, uh, which is a big honor in the conducting world and one of the finest orchestras in Eastern Europe. And it was a great honor to be there. It was a big deal. 
And my sense of that was, yes, I, I wished to do justice to the composer's work with his, with his 30 minutes symphony that he had written. As important to me was I wished to convey a sense of love and uh, the presence of joy to these people in Eastern Europe. And there's a, there's a story here, if you'll permit me to tell it, I would love to tell it because it comes directly to overcoming challenges in many ways. So, so uh, it was late November of 2003, and it was very cold in Bulgaria. And at the time, um, that particular country was about five years out from under communism. So they were still reeling from the effects of this newfound sense of democracy and all of the national and personal travesty that... Uh, communism has been known to produce. So here I am uh, in Bulgaria. I'm staying in a five-star hotel, very cold out. And uh, I, we'd walk around the city and you could see the old communist buildings. The city was still half in disrepair. There were literally holes in the sidewalk that were not marked. You'd literally just fall down a hole in the sidewalk. Beggars on the street. And the juxtaposition would be that there were five-star hotels and elegant restaurants and people walking around in fur coats stepping out of a Mercedes. So it was, it was really a, a, an eye-opener about what, what a misguided government, in my opinion, can and cannot do. And uh, the, the rest of the story is that I was traveling with the composer, who was an American composer, his wife, and a singer who was involved in the project. All four of us got food poisoning. And I was especially sick the day before I was to conduct and the day I was to conduct. This was part of an international project with Bulgaria and the United States and would, would be uh, was a recording project. And ultimately, this, this music would end up on our national public radio. And I had five hours to go in and rehearse the orchestra and do a recording of a 30-minute symphony that was exceptionally difficult. And I was so sick, I could barely stand up. And um, so talk about a challenge. Add to that that uh, I don't speak Bulgarian. I do not read the Cyrillic alphabet. And very few of these people understood English. So here I'm sick as a dog. And I'm standing in front of an 84-piece orchestra. It's very cold. And they, you know, we don't have, an, we don't have a common language, so to speak. And um, it was <laughs> it was probably one of the most difficult challenges of my career. And I just wanted to just, you know, go back to the hotel room and be sick. And there was no one who could do the job for me. So I had to take my courage in my hands and stand up strong and tall and rise to the occasion and go on that podium and do my work. And uh, talk about fear. Uh, I had no idea how they would receive me. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a woman standing in front of an Eastern European orchestra and they're five years out from under communism. What was remarkable and what was my spur to being strong was the first time I stopped the orchestra in rehearsal, tapped on that music stand and stopped the orchestra to talk to them. 84 people jumped in their seats. And I said, like, like, like an abused puppy. And at that point, my heart opened for these people. And I thought, you know, they, they have been treated very badly by their, probably by their country as citizens and maybe by the conductors who come through here. I don't know it for a fact, but it, it was just a matter that they had been treated sternly, let me put it that way. And here I come with my heart of love and my nurturing spirit. And I thought these people are used to being browbeaten into playing well, and I don't function that way. I function out of love. And so I began speaking to them and making sure my body language was warm and open, inviting, comforting. And then the concertmaster did get up and translate for me, and I had a few moments of fear about what he was actually saying. You know, this stupid American woman who doesn't know what she's doing was what my, my fear was telling me. But when he sat back down, the orchestra did exactly as I asked them. And I remember looking in his eyes and just smiling and saying a silent thank you. So we proceeded from there, and at the end of the first movement, there was a harp solo, and this harpist was a beautiful woman, and she played this solo incredibly beautifully, and I broke a, I broke a rule of conducting. I got emotion, and I said in English, oh, that was beautiful, and she got it. She understood the smile on my face, and I remember making eye contact with her, and her eyes lit up, and from there, Sammy, we were off and running, and it was, it was another four hours of incredible creation, and on the first break, the Bulgarian production team came to me and said, we've never heard the orchestra sound like this. And at first I panicked. And she said, no, I mean, we've never heard the orchestra play with this much confidence, this much love, and this much assurance. She said, you're getting another sound out of these people. And I said, I simply love them. So it was a huge success in the final analysis to make this recording. Uh, the next day, I went on the podium to help conduct something that I was not scheduled to conduct. And when I came to that sound stage to be like our equivalent of Carnegie Hall, the orchestra rose to their feet to receive me and applaud me, and they didn't have to. And I stood there with tears running down my face. I had done 
nothing more than love them completely, accept them, and encourage them. And uh, there are the better conductors in the world than I, certainly. Um, but I came in there with love. And the, the love obliterated the fear. They didn't know me. They were probably as afraid as I. And uh, I went back a year later on another project, just the, this time, just myself and a singer from Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I arrived that morning, and again, they, ro- they rose to their feet. Bottom line was, when I went back to Bulgaria the second year, as they say, the orchestra rose to their feet and uh, received me with applause and they weren't required to do that by protocol and I thought I have made my mark here of love and accept and joy and we went right to work on my second uh, my second year there and had an incredible time and I will always remember that as a highlight of my conducting career uh, and I carried that with me back to the United States of America and everywhere I've ever been simply to proceed precede my my actions with love and proceed with love. And I think your story, you know, really it almost transcends music with your with your message of love and kindness and openness and um I think there's just so much there between, you know, the the mass communication major and me loves the nonverbal communication, especially with other cultures and all of that stuff. But also for young women, you know, possibly wanting to go in a career of medicine or business which you know, maybe 50 years ago was dominated by men that we're seeing take such a great shift towards more equality for women in our society. And, you know, um, I, I just think that story just hit on so many great things that uh, some of our younger and even older uh, listeners can learn so much from. And as we're almost running out of time here, uh, I just wanted to ask you, you know, what, what advice could you give to our young listeners about getting involved with the, with the music industry? And do you think that public schools having good music programs uh, can help foster and develop some of that uh, talent? Absolutely. I'm a big believer, big proponent of music education being a mandatory part of a curriculum, whether it's piano, voice, other instruments, music reading, I'm a big proponent of that because it changes how the brain perceives information. This is scientifically been, pro- or been proven scientifically. I'm also a big proponent of ballet being part of our physical education. Uh, I, and I know, you know, we're talking about challenges, you know, the best ballet teacher I ever had was a woman who was 66 years old and walked with a cane. She, overcome, she had overcome her physical challenges, and she was the best teacher that I ever had in that regard. So I would love to see ballet, at least, or at least some, some form of dance, be included in our physical education because, again, scientifically, it is one of the best uses of the body. So I'm a big proponent of the arts being at the forefront of our education. We learn to express, we learn to understand ourselves, we learn to understand our bodies. And by the way, the music language, the musical alphabet contains only seven letters. It's the simplest, most straightforward language on the planet. I'm a big proponent of this being mandatory education from grade school on up through the 12th grade. Wonderful. And just last question here. Uh, where could the listeners find uh, some of your music if they wanted to listen um, and if you'd like to give the website to go to your book just one more time, why not? Perfect. As for the book, it's balboapress.com. The title of the book is My Letter to My Father. Father's Day is coming up. Make a great gift. As far as my music, if people wish to buy my CDs, and we've not talked a lot about my music, but certainly another time we could, but I've got some great music for, for uh, listening and inspiration got two CDs for sale, and they can be purchased at cdbaby.com. That's cdbaby.com. And as a footnote, uh, my new website, uh, dbaregal.com, will be uh, rolling out in the month of June, and there's going to be a lot of exciting upgrades and improvements. And uh, I would love to have another opportunity to talk with you over the phone, perhaps do another interview, and uh, share more about what's happening with my newest music uh, and what people can uh, can gain from that. And uh, I, actually, as my uh, new website comes up, I'll be offering a free weekly email love letter, which talks about loving ourselves and how to do that in miraculous and wonderful ways and how to love others. And I'll be offering that as part of my new rollout on my new website next month. So I'd love to be back in touch with you, Sammy, and have the privilege of doing another interview with, with you if I may be so bold as to invite myself. <laughs> Absolutely. Invite yourself away. And, you know, I just want to thank you, Deirdre, uh, for taking the time out to be on our show today. You gave our listeners such great insights, and I really cannot thank you enough for that on mine and Mark's behalf. 
this is Sammy Sandler, guest host for today's podcast, Lighting the Educational Flame. If you have any questions or you are interested in guest hosting one of our shows, email Mark Hoberman at info at gradesuccess.com. That is uh, info at gradesuccess.com, G-R-A-D-E-S-U-C-C-E-S-S.com. Uh, thank you for listening today and we'll be sure to have some more great episodes for you soon. Thank you for listening to Lighting the Educational Flame with Mark Overman. To contact Mark, email him at info at gradesuccess.com.